Our, our scripture passage this morning will be brought to us by a special guest who will be appearing over here, so I direct your attention to uh, this space over here. <laughs> Hi, my name is Pepper. Don't be afraid. I love to help humans and make them happy. I am sorry I cannot be there in person. I was thrilled to receive Shelley's invitation to share this important story with you. I knew Kent would find a way of making it possible. I would like to tell you about one of the most amazing events in the history of the humans. It is called a sound like a strong wind. This story was originally told by a guy named Luke, and is found in the second chapter of a book called Acts. Here is how it goes. About 2,000 years ago, when the Feast of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Without warning there was a sound like a strong wind. No one could tell where it came from. It filled the whole building. Then, like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread through the ranks, and they started speaking in a number of different languages as the Spirit prompted them. There were many Jews staying in Jerusalem just then, devout pilgrims from all over the world. When they heard the sound, they came on the run. Then when they heard, one after another, their own mother tongues being spoken, they were thunderstruck. They couldn't for the life of them figure out what was going on, and kept saying, Aren't these all Galileans? How come we're hearing them talk in our various mother tongues? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites. Visitors from Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia. Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia. Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene. Immigrants from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Even Cretans and Arabs. They said, they are speaking our languages, describing God's mighty works. Their heads were spinning. They couldn't make head or tail of any of it. They talked back and forth, confused. What's going on here? Others joked, they're drunk on cheap wine. That's when Peter stood up and, backed by the other eleven, spoke out with bold urgency. Fellow Jews, all of you were visiting Jerusalem. Listen carefully, and get this story straight. These people aren't drunk as some of you suspect. They haven't had time to get drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. This is what the prophet Joel announced would happen. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on every kind of people. Your sons will prophesy, also your daughters. Your young men will see visions, your old men dream dreams. When the time comes, I will pour out my spirit on those who serve me, men and women both, and I will prophesy. I will set wonders in the sky above then signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billowing smoke, the sun turning black and the moon blood red. Before the day of the Lord arrives, the day tremendous and marvelous, and whoever calls out for help to me, God, will be saved. That is it. I hope you liked this story. Now Shelley will tell you more about it. Thank you, Pepper, for reading us, for telling us that story. <laughs> and good morning again to all of you. <clears throat> Welcome to Calvary on this day of Pentecost. Um, my name is Shelley Faulkner and I'm honored to be here today as we celebrate this important and dramatic um, festival and time. Pastor David is away spending some time with his wife. <clears throat> so before I tell you a bit more about Pepper and how she's connected to Pentecost, please join me for a word of prayer. <clears throat> oh Lord, open our eyes to behold your presence. O oh Lord, open our ears to hear your voice. O oh Lord, open our hearts to receive your love. O oh Lord, help us to behold, to hear, and to receive your word, that our mouths may proclaim your praise. Amen. 
I guess Pepper's gone. <laughs> Pepper, isn't she cute? She, she's a human interaction robot, and she appeared for us today courtesy of my husband Kent's office. The place where Kent works specializes in disruption by design. <clears throat> Kent and his team create immersive, immersive experiences for their clients that disrupt ordinary thinking patterns in order to reveal new possibilities and provoke action. Pepper is one of a number of resources that they use in these immersive, disruptive experiences. And if you want to know more about Ken's job, I'm sure he'd be happy to tell you all about it. Because <laughs> I don't really honestly know what he does. <laughs> he works with robots and drones and all kinds of fancy things. <laughs> <clears throat> Disruption seems to be a theme these days. The CBC program, The Current, has been doing a series called The Disruptors, and some of you may have heard about it. Anna Maria Tremonti is, ex is exploring how the world is changing. <clears throat> and this is how the series is described on their webpage. From entrepreneurs to social movements, politicians to philanthropists, people and their beliefs are upsetting the orthodoxy for better or for worse changing how we live, changing our sense of ourselves and society. This series also features moments of disruption, which are stories from ordinary people who have had their lives changed by something, ex un by something unexpected. I've heard some of these moments of disruption and they are quite powerful and compelling. These stories feature the defining moments of people's lives and we learn what made them into the people they are today kind of like the backstories of the superheroes. And uh, if you want to know more about those, the, the stories are featured on the current webpage, and they are, they're very interesting stories to listen to. <clears throat> we love to hear stories like this, stories about real people being transformed, beating the odds, stories about the life-changing experiences that, and life-changing adventures that people have had. And these stories are especially powerful when they are connected to an important event. In just under a month, Canada will be celebrating the 150th anniversary of Confederation. And one of the ways this event is being celebrated is through storytelling. People are being encouraged to submit videos and pictures highlighting what it means to be Canadian. And we are also hearing historical stories, stories about how Canada became a nation, origin stories. Origin stories are important. They help us remember who we are. Origin stories capture our imagination. And as we think about the past, we are spurred on to dream about the future. There are many origin stories, from the origin stories of the superheroes, to the origin story of Canada, to the most important origin story of all, the story of create, the creation of the world, and of humanity, which is the opening story found in our Bible. And it seems to me that all these origin stories have something in common. They all involve moments of disruption. So even though disruption seems to be in the air these days, it is definitely not a new concept. God has been disrupting things for a long time. The biblical origin story and the stories that follow are the foundation of our Christian faith. Throughout the Old Testament, God disrupts the lives of ordinary people. From Abraham to Joseph to, to many others, including the prophets, God was constantly calling his people to new things, to surprising things. And as he called them, he showed them great miracles and provided for them in unexpected ways. Then in the New Testament, we find the story of Pentecost, the story about the foundation of the church, our origin story. And here, God disrupts things yet again, this time in a particularly dramatic way. <clears throat> so let's take a closer look at this story, this moment of disruption, which is found in the second chapter of the book of Acts. As Pepper reminded us, this story is told by Luke, the same person who wrote the Gospel of Luke. So Luke and Acts are generally considered to be one book which tells an integrated story. This story was originally told to a man named Theophilus, which means a friend or lover of God. And the Gospel of Luke focuses on the most disruptive story of all, the story of Jesus, 
his birth, life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. Then we come to the book of Acts, and at the beginning of Acts, we find a recap of recent events. This is how Acts starts in chapter one. To Theophilus, the first book I wrote about was, the first book I wrote was about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up into heaven. Before this, with the help of the Holy Spirit, Jesus told the apostles he had chosen what they should do. After his death, he showed himself to them and proved in many ways that he was alive. The apostles saw Jesus during the 40 days after he was raised from the dead. And he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. Once when he was eating with them, he told them not to leave Jerusalem. He said, wait here to receive the promise from the Father which I told you about. John baptized people with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. When the apostles were all together, they asked Jesus, Lord, are you now going to give the kingdom back to Israel? Jesus said to them, the father is the only one who has the authority to decide dates and times. These things are not for you to know. But when the Holy Spirit comes to you, you will receive power. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, in Samaria, and in every part of the world. After this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud hid, hid him from their sight. As he was going, they were looking into the sky. Suddenly, two men wearing white clothes stood beside them. They said, men of Galilee, why do, are you standing here looking into the sky? Jesus, whom you saw taken up from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you saw him go. Then they went back to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. The disciples lived through some amazing times. When we think of all that they witnessed and experienced, sometimes we wish we could have all experienced all those things ourselves. But on the other hand, they witnessed and experienced a lot of disruption and anxiety and confusion. Jesus was always surprising them, not doing what they expected, not following the rules, turning things upside down. After Jesus died on the cross, they were devastated and fearful. But three days later, he rose from the dead and they experienced great joy. Then, after 40 days, Jesus was gone again, descended into heaven. I'm sure they were wondering, what are we supposed to do now? Well, Jesus told them to return to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit to come. What did that even mean? But the disciples obeyed Jesus and went to Jerusalem and waited. For 10 days, nothing happened. But suddenly, during the Feast of Pentecost, when many people were in the city for this annual celebration, suddenly there was a noise like a strong blowing wind that came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw something like flames of fire that were separated and stood over each person there. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak different languages by the power the Holy Spirit was giving them. These words from Acts chapter two represent the only description we have of this event, this coming of the Holy Spirit, this moment of disruption. <clears throat> it sounds pretty crazy. A noise like a strong blowing wind, flames of fire. And then what happens next is even more amazing. A crowd gathered, having heard the sound of the wind. Then they heard their own mother tongues being spoken. And how did they respond? Well, in the same ways that we often respond to things we don't understand. Some were skeptical, assuming that the disciples were drunk but others genuinely wanted to know what was going on. So Peter, the main leader of this small group of believers, took the opportunity to explain everything to them. Acts chapter two, verses 14 to 36 is the first sermon, the first recorded sermon about Jesus after he'd been taken up into heaven. 
In these verses, Peter told them that what was prophesied in the Old Testament had now been fulfilled. He specifically referred to the book of Joel where it is written, I will pour out my spirit on all kinds of people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. Then anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. After Peter was finished his sermon, the people gathered around him asked, so now what do we do? And Peter responded, change your hearts and lives and be baptized each one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away. It is for everyone the Lord our God calls to himself. And the people did respond. Luke tells us that in those days, and that those people who, were, who accepted what Peter said were baptized. And about 3,000 people were added to the number of believers that day. So they went from a core group of about 120, and then within hours, there were 3,000 who now believed in Jesus. So what are we to make of this story? Well, in some ways, it is very clear. We are called to repent, to be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit. But then what? Well, after we've received the Holy Spirit, often it means our lives are gonna be disrupted. <laughs> But we will be empowered to do great things. We are empowered to tell others about Jesus, and we are given superpowers. Uh, I mean, gifts of the Spirit. <laughs> gifts and abilities which enable each of us to serve God. What really struck me as I studied the story of Pentecost is that since the first coming of the Spirit 2,000 years ago, since the first moment of disruption, there have been many more such moments. The Spirit comes again to each new generation, empowering Christians to continue to spread the good news. And God's Spirit comes to each of us individually, disrupting our lives and calling us to follow him. God has disrupted my life countless times, but my most significant moment of disruption came as I was participating in a confirmation class at the United Church that I attended with my family. Thinking back, it seems a bit crazy, but anyway, our confirmation class went together to a David Wilkerson crusade. This was back in the 70s when David Wilkerson was going around to different communities, and he actually did a crusade in North Bay. And at that event, I heard God's voice calling to me, calling me to love and serve him. And since then, God has continued to speak to me, sometimes in dramatic ways and sometimes in quiet moments. What moments of disruption have you experienced other than hearing the word of God spoken by a robot? As you gather together over coffee following the service or in the coming days, I invite you to share your stories. How has God been at work in your life? For the past year, I've been hearing about Kent's job and how his team creates immersive, experience, immersive experiences for their clients. The more I think about it, the more their business pattern sounds strangely familiar. They go about disrupting ordinary thinking patterns in order to reveal new possibilities and provoke action. Isn't that what God has been doing in the church for over 2,000 years? Isn't that the story of Pentecost? Isn't that our story today? God's spirit is present among us, guiding us and leading us, disrupting us. One commentator offered the important reminder that the Holy Spirit is not just a force, not just a strong wind. He is the third person of the Trinity, God in every way. God really is with his people through the Spirit, with us at Calvary Baptist Church. Through the Spirit, we are being led into something new, a new moment of disruption. Do we believe that? Are we expecting God to do the unexpected? Over the past year, Pastor David and the mission team have been praying about the future, talking and praying about who we are as a church and what we are called to do in this community, what new things, what disruptive things is God calling us to do? 
How have we been empowered by the Spirit as a church and as individuals? What gifts have we been given and how can we use those gifts to glorify God and serve his people? So I hope you will stick around this place and join us, join in on what God is doing here at Calvary Baptist. Some of the things that our mission team has been talking about and praying about will be discussed next Sunday at the huddle that Victoria mentioned. So we hope that you will bring some food to share and uh, come and join us at our potluck to hear about some of these things. God has been interrupting and disrupting things for a long time. So why should he stop now? As we move into the unknown future, my prayer is that we'll, well, we will all come to a fuller knowledge of God and a fuller understanding of our calling and the gifts that we have been given through the Spirit so that together we may continue to love and serve the Lord in this community. Expect the unexpected from God and do not be afraid. Amen.